welcome to the participants for your registration thank you again and again the for you the participants that you made a good platform for nature club of rajapalayam rajesh college thank you very much all the participants it been because of you we honored thank you so much this is rajapalayam rajesh college rajapalayam nature club and wildlife association of rajapalayam war jointly organized international webinar on a trip to the past history of life through fossils by our resource person nirmal raja education coordinator meha archaeological museum sarja united arab emirates thank you and it's a time i want to thank mr raj kumar uh, who is from kadayanallur now he is working in uh, uae because of such person i got the eminent resource person on this day today thank you rajkumar sir ra one and all i thank my uh, sincere thanks to our rajkumar sir and it's a time to intro our eminent resource person mr nilmar raja sir the recording nirmal raja sir he had his swarthy degree ug and a master degree in biotechnology been interest in evolution since childhood as a result been collecting fossils for the past 10 years in 2015 first stand alone documentary on indian fossils he received reviews from the prominent indian academicians as well as geologists and the paleontologists from the united states geological survey he has been lecturing students and general public about fossils and evolutionary biology since then in 2018 started scientific tamilan youtube channel to discuss science and our geological field trip to tamil audience and currently has over 91000 subscribers and has worked with tamil nadu science forum recently organizing a week long webinar workshop on science communication sir welcome sir welcome sir thank it you it is so much, uh, really sir. it is honor to have such persons today on the topic a trip to the past history of life through fossil thank you very much sir thank you sir uh, can you hear me now sir yes sir is audible sir yeah thank you so much for the wonderful uh, intro and thank you mr rajkumar for the chance to uh, speak to your uh, uh, members of the group so if it is if it is okay i can start right now okay sir okay sir okay so uh, thank you everyone for attending this lecture so um, it is going to be in english all, uh, but the slides are going to be in tamil also uh, just to make sure that everyone gets the technical terms very uh, correctly so i'm going to divide this uh, entire uh, lecture into three parts so first 30 minutes I'm, i'm just going to give you a very quick introduction of the entire uh, topic uh, the trip to the past so technically we are going to travel into the past and trying to understand what happened in the past of the planet and how we can understand what really happened in the past through fossils so fossils are like uh, some of the evidences that tells us the story about uh, the natural history of life on this planet and the second part is like i just don't want the lecture to be a bunch of slides and i'm talking to you but i also want the lecture to be very interactive so before uh, covid happened i used to take all the fossils with me uh, to all the schools and colleges and so that so that students can actually touch and see the fossils themselves uh, it is more like a museum on wheels so a museum technically comes to your place and you can actually see the fossils uh, that technically is what i'm talking about So the second part is going to be me talking to you a little bit about. I'm also going to show you some uh, really cool fossils that I have in my collection here in in, in Dubai. And the last part uh, is for for 15 to 20 minutes where I'll be taking some of the questions uh, uh, if you have any. So basically, I'll just go uh, this one. So we have the portrait of Charles Darwin, uh, who we'll be talking about. Um, uh, Charles Darwin actually explained how evolution uh, through natural selection happens. so uh, uh, plenty of scientists before uh, darwin also tried to uh, explain the diversity of life on this planet but darwin got it right uh, darwin explained the processes that shapes uh, the evolution of life uh, in the planet and below that one you can also see a small uh, a word that says uh, i think 
So this is a, 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 a small uh, word that, that Darwin wrote on his diary. Uh, he was thinking about, he was writing about uh, the evolution through natural history and natural selection. And this was a very popular uh, line that he uh, used in his book. So basically, uh, we talk about evolution. So evolution is like, you know, to be honest, I mean, like when you just go outside, when you just go to Western Ghats or Eastern Ghats, or it's just, just go to any other place, you see a, a variety of animals. So if you take beetles, there are like thousands of species of beetles. There are thousands of species and genus of uh, fish in the sea. There are, it's not just fish in the sea, but there are other animals also. But if you have wondered why we have so many animals uh, around us, so evolution is a process that sort of explains why we have so many animals uh, around us. So life had very simple beginnings. Uh, four billion years ago, it started as a small uh, single cell organism. And over the course of time, it evolved. First, it evolved multi multicellularity. And then it went on and on. And evolution was sort of progressive. It looks progressive. And then we have all the animals that we have in the, meat, in, in the middle. We still have animals that went extinct uh, millions of years ago. And right now we have animals that we see today. So uh, there are plenty of evidences to explain the process of evolution. So one of the, uh, uh, we are not going to get into the technical details of the process of, that shape evolution. For example, uh, there are processes called uh, sexual selection. There are processes called natural selection, uh, uh, geographical separation and other ones. We're not going to get into that one, but we're gonna talk about certain uh, evidences that tells us how evolution actually happened. So imagine the entire uh, uh, evolutionary biology, evolutionary history of the uh, planet, like a crime scene. So basically you have a crime scene, the detective goes to the crime scene, the detective looks for evidences uh, of the traces or evidences that the murderer or whoever it is, the criminal left behind. So by carefully re reconstructing all the evidences, you can reconstruct exactly how the process happened. So one of the most important evidences for evolution, even at the time of Darwin, uh, people actually consider this as the uh, prime evidence for evolution, which is fossils. So fossils are nothing but remains of animals that lived and went extinct several thousand years ago. So for example, uh, if you find a dinosaur bone, uh, dinosaurs lived like six, six, 66 million years ago. So dinosaur bones are technically fossils. Uh, there are still many other animals that lived even after dinosaur or even before dinosaur. So in order to consider any living uh, part or uh, a living part, a part of a living animal, it has to be over 10,000 years old. So anything that is a bone or a shell or anything that is 10,000 years old, it will be considered fossils. And the second one is like homologous structures. So basically you see wings uh, in birds. We have uh, same sort of bones uh, that makes us our arms. Also, if you just go and see bats, so bats also has uh, sort of uh, arms that is modified into a, a wing, which has a, a, a leathery membrane over it. Then we have vestigial organs, organs that once we had some sort of a use, then over the course of time, it lost uh, any uh, sort of purpose. And then we have biogeography. For example, there are different kinds of animals in Australia. So there's a reason why we have uh, kangaroos in Australia and not in other parts of the world. Uh, so that sort of also explains how evolution happened. And then we have embryology, how uh, the embryo develops from a single cell into multicellular uh, organisms and finally into a, um, a, a juvenile uh, animal or in case of humans it develops into a baby and one the last most important very crucial and very modern evidence for evolution is dna evidence so basically uh, 20 years ago when we sequenced the human genome uh, ever since then uh, sequencing technology has moved forward sequencing has been uh, very easy and very cheap so we can actually look into any sort of animals. We can look into the genes and understand how similar these animals are at the genetic level. That sort of explains how evolution happens. So we are not going to talk about all other uh, uh, evidences. We are going to talk only about fossils today. So basically, people uh, were collecting fossils for a very long time. People didn't really understand fossils initially. So here you can actually see an ammonite. This is a cephalopod that lived uh, during the Jurassic and the Cretaceous period. So in ancient times, for example, in UK, uh, England, people didn't really know what really happened. And then they sort of made mythological stories around ammonites. So some people thought the, there used to be a, an island in uh, UK where uh, it was infested with snakes. So they uh, had a story that says that a person called Saint Hilda, she came to that area and cursed all the snakes. And all the snakes beca became uh, stones and coiled up uh, like stone snakes. So this is a 
uh, a story that people actually imagine to explain these ammonites. But these ammonites are uh, mostly related to modern day octopuses, for example, nautiluses and other ones. So the first one to understand what really fossils are, like for, for example, fossils are nothing but preserved remains of animals that lived in the past is Leonardo da Vinci. So Leonardo da Vinci, as you know, is an Italian uh, polymath, is a, is, a, is a genius who invented several different inventions and also a great painter. But uh, an unknown side of Leonardo da Vinci is also, he is a natural historian. He, he tried to explain uh, nature. So he first correctly understood that the fossil is nothing but a remain of an animal uh, that lived in the past. And then we have uh, the reason why we use fossils is to reconstruct the evolutionary history of a particular animal. So for example, here you can actually see three different animals. So for example, Ambulocetus uh, is a sort of a whale that lived uh, in what is now Pakistan. So for example, if you are wondering uh, how whales came into being, so we go to the oceans, we see all the whales, but whales are not fish. Uh, whales are technically mammals. Uh, they give birth to live young ones and they also feed the young and they are technically uh, mammals and not a fish. But if you have wondered what a mammal is doing in a sea, then we have to look into the fossil remains of uh, whales. For example, if you just go back and back in time, back in time, if you compare the similarities of the fossil bones with the living uh, whales, you can carefully reconstruct how the whale came or how the whale uh, left the land and moved into the ocean. So if you go like enough time, if you go back to the Cretaceous period, if you just go like say uh, 70 to 60 million years ago, uh, uh, the ancestors of the whale, uh, which is called Pachycetus, was living on the land. It was like a dog-like animal walking on all four uh, 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 legs. And then it entered a uh, sea and it gradually adapted to the ocean uh, environment and became what is now a whale. So this is how fossils help us that uh, to reconstruct what really happened or reconstruct our evolutionary past. For example, if you have just uh, uh, in a popular culture, we know that uh, uh, people say that humans evolved from monkeys, which is not technically true. We didn't ev really evolve from monkeys, but we evolved from monkey-like animals or ape-like creatures that didn't have a tail. So in order to say that statement, in order to come to that conclusion that we evolved from an ape-like ancestors, we really needed uh, fossil evidences that we found in Africa. So, uh, so what is a fossil? So basically, <coughs> here you can actually see two different animals. So basically, in the left-hand side, you can actually see a living nautilus. So basically, that nautiluses are found in deep sea environments. If you just go deep sea diving, say 300, 400 meters down, you can see these kind of creatures. These are cephalopods. These are they, they are related. They are mollusks basically, but they come under a section called cephalopods. So uh, even uh, octopuses are considered cephalopods. And to the right hand side, you can also see a stone like structure. This is an internal impression of a nautilus that lived something around 83 million years ago. And there was a huge sea that covered what is now South India. So for example, uh, the, uh, the earth is very dynamic. So what is now uh, a mountain uh, will not be a mountain several million years from today. Or what used to be a, a bottom of the sea will not be a bottom of the sea several million years from today. It keeps changing every now and then. So uh, several million years ago, at least 66 million years ago, there was a shallow sea that covered most of South India. And this small stone-like uh, thing is a fossil of a nautilus that lived in that shallow sea. So basically, this is a process that how an animal ends up into a fossil. So basically, uh, in the other corner, you can actually see a triceratops, a dinosaur that lived in North America. So this dinosaur has to die, or this animal has to die. And it has to be quickly covered with sediments. So a sediment can be brought in by uh, basically any different uh, natural environments. For example, if an animal dies in the desert, so basically desert environment has a lot of sandstorms and other ones, it has to be quickly covered by sand. Or if it dies next to a riverbed or if it dies in an ocean bed, it sinks down to the bottom of the uh, sea or the river and quickly gets covered by uh, sediments brought in by the water. And once it gets covered by water, the slowly the bones will be replaced. The bones are made up of calcium. So these organic material will be replaced by inorganic material, which seeps in through the water. So basically the water will carry a lot of minerals in it. And the minerals can come inside and seep into the bones and replace. This is, this is a process called permineralization. So after this replacement, what happens is the bones stay there for millions of years. And the surface land features actually changes every now and then. And once it does, 
these bones uh, stay there for millions of years. They're gradually taken, turn into rocks. So fossils are nothing but technically rocks. They just take a shape of the bone. And because of rain and wind and other uh, processes, the mountains can be eroded and these fossils can be exposed and paleontologists can go to those areas, find out and carefully excavate those bones and reconstruct those bones and try to understand what that animal looked like and what that animal lived and how it evolved. And you might be having a question uh, like how do people or geologists or paleontologists try to um, understand how old a fossil is? So basically here you can actually see a small hillock, uh, which is next to my place uh, where I work in uh, Sharjah. So this is a limestone mountain. And you can, if you can see two different colors of rocks, so one is a very pale brown color rock, which is on the top. And there's a darker black color rock in the bottom. So fossils are mostly found only in sedimentary rocks. So basically on the top, you can actually see sedimentary rock. And fossils are not found in igneous rocks because igneous rock is nothing but um, a lava which cools down and becomes rock. So uh, here you can actually see two different layers. And if you look carefully in the sedimentary rock on the top, you can see several different uh, layers. So there's, there's a process called, there's a principle in geology called principle of superposition. In that one, so uh, if you take a small cake, for example, uh, it, it, the cake is made up of five to six different layers here. So you can actually see a blue layer on the top, a uh, bottom, and a red layer on the top, and the yellow layer on the middle. So if you are wondering which layer was laid first by the baker, it is always the bottommost layer. And so basically the, the violet layer is the oldest one, then comes the blue, then comes the green, yellow, orange, and red. So if you go to any mountain, so if you see, if you go to a mountain, if you see uh, different layers, or if, if you, you would have driven through rock cut areas. So these are areas where, where they actually uh, cut a mountain and they would have laid a road through the mountain. So if you see that one, if you can see the sides of the mountain, if you see layers, uh, always assume that the oldest layer is always in the bottom or most part of the uh, area and the youngest layer is always on the top. So here, if you find a fossil in the violet layer or if you find a fossil in the blue layer, it will be older than the fossils that are found in the green. The green one will be older than the one that are found in yellow. So it gets older and older as you go deeper and deeper. So in that mountain, if you can see, at the topmost part of the mountain is uh, formed something around 68 to 66 million years ago when the Cretaceous period ended. And then the middle part of the mountain is something around 72 to 68 million years ago. Uh, and then the bottom part of the mountain is 72 to 82 million years ago. So that's how uh, it is called relative dating. This is uh, how you can superficially determine an age of a fossil. For example, if I'm climbing the mountain, if I find a, a fossil in the middle of that mountain, uh, where I marked 72 to 68 million years ago, that fossil tends to be older than the fossil that I find in the top of the mountain. So this is a geological time scale. So um, if you are really interested in knowing the past, you should understand a term called deep time. So when I'm talking about deep time, so we don't really understand. This chart actually talks to you about different time periods. For example, uh, Oligocene is a time period that existed 33 million years ago and ended 23 million years ago. Or if you want to go back in time, say, for example, uh, Jurassic uh, time period. Jurassic, the late Jurassic started something around 164 million years ago and ended 145 million years ago. So when I'm talking about millions of years, it's really, really tough for anybody to understand or grasp, grasp that time, actually. Because what happened is like our brains are programmed by evolution to understand our perceived time in days and months, not in millions of years. Even when I say uh, the Tanjore Big Temple was built something around 1,000 or uh, like 1,100 years ago, it is very tough for us to grasp or understand or appreciate that deep time. So when you're talking about millions of years, it's very tough for a human brain to understand that part. So to make it very simple, uh, there is a calendar. There's a sort of a calendar, for example, if you shrink the entire history of the universe, which is 13.5, the universe began uh, by a process called Big Bang, something around 13.5 billion years ago. So if you if you shrink all 13.5 billion years into one year, so the 1st of January is when the universe began, like, uh, begins. So that is when the Big Bang happens. And only during May, which is January, February, March, April, May, I only after five months, uh, you get the Milky Way in which our uh, planet and our planetary uh, systems are. And then only around September 9, which is like after nine months, uh, the sun began. I mean, the like sun is formed. And even after that one, after nine months and 25th of September, which is 4.5 billion years from today, the first cell uh, begins. So that's when we have the first unicellular organisms. 
Then we have six, uh, male and female divide something around November 1st. And then we go on, then uh, basically photosynthesis evolves. And then uh, something around December 1st, which is like after 11 months, uh, we get oxygen. So oxygen is also uh, a product of a first living being. And then we have uh, 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 plants, and then we have dinosaurs, which uh, dinosaurs evolved like 220 million years ago, which is just say uh, seven days from New Year's Day. So it goes on and on and on. Like to be honest, like uh, uh, when the dinosaurs were alive, uh, when the first mammals came into being, there were no flowers in the uh, in the in, in the world. Flowers came in very very late, and then uh, humans came in something around December 30. And also, if you just go on and on and on. So for example, when I'm talking about uh, uh, agriculture, which started like roughly 14,000 years ago. 14,000 years is like 31st of December, 11, 59, 51 minutes. This is just nine seconds away from New Year. And for example, if you just go to Kiridi, which is like 2,400 years old civilization that existed, what is now Sivaganga and Madurai, that existed only two seconds away from what is a New Year. So uh, Tanjore Big Temple was built like one second away, which is like one second is like 1,000 years. And we are right now here in 31st of December, exactly before the New Year's Eve. So that's how uh, we can understand the 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 magnanimity, the the entire time into one single year. So we are. We, I'm going to just talk about uh, the origins, the emergence, the first life uh, that starts. So this is one of the oldest rock in the world, which is actually found in uh, Canada. So you can actually find these rocks in different parts of the world, even the base of India. Is actually made up of a very uh, thick continental crust which uh, evolved several billion years ago. But if you want to see the oldest rock, which is it is called Acasta, Acasta Nice. So this rock is uh, exposed in uh, what is now uh, Canada. So this rock is approximately four billion years ago. Even when I say the oldest rock uh, that we can actually find, uh, the oldest rocks are already gone. It, it is destroyed because every now and then the earth produces new rocks and the rocks get destroyed again and again. So that's one reason why we don't find the oldest rock, which is already destroyed. And this is the oldest that we have here. And then as soon as the earth solidifies, so there's a process called accretion when the rocks, molten rocks came into came together and they hardened and they became a rocky planet. As soon as the earth cooled and the, the temperatures became normal, the first life evolved. Uh, as of now, we have fossil evidences from what is now a place called Pilbara. Uh, it is in Western Australia. If you just go to Pilbara, you can actually see fossils. These are called microfossils. So you can actually see fossils of primitive bacteria or unicellular organisms that lived something around 4 billion years ago. And also, at the same time, you can also infer that evidence. You can also cross-check that uh, finding with the molecular evidences that we have. For example, we have uh, genetic data from different animals that we have. For example, bacteria, so you have archaea, you have algae, you have uh, all other sort of animals we have the genetic sequences of. By comparing all these sequences, you can understand when the common ancestor, or the, that means the first cell uh, from which all the animals diversified, that probably lived something around 4 billion years ago. So that kind of validates the fossil evidences here. And then we have uh, the great oxygenation event that began, for example, even life came in something around 4 billion years ago. For the first 2.5 billion years, nothing really happened. Life was very boring. So that's the reason why geologists call the first 2.5 billion years as a boring billion. That means nothing much happened, even if you take a time machine, go back in time, go to a sea. Uh, you won't see any sort of plants in the uh, land. Uh, most of the earth is covered with uh, water. And if you see any sort of animal, it could have been a very simple cell, a unicellular organism, nothing more, nothing uh, better than that one. And suddenly after 2.5 billion years ago, these animals, one of these early cyanobacteria uh, evolved a process by which it can actually uh, photosynthesize. It can actually tur turn uh, 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 atmospheric ion. So basically what happens is like there is plenty of erosion that's happening on the land. And that kind of brings in a lot of iron to the uh, sea area. So by producing oxygen, this oxygen reacts with this iron and produce, produces iron oxide. And basically what happened is that oxygen, which is dissolved in the water, accumulates in the atmosphere. And that is uh, the reason why we have so much of oxygen right now. So basically, uh, right now we have 21% oxygen in our atmosphere. And every uh, molecule of oxygen that we breathe, uh, for example, if you're breathing, say, 100 molecules of oxygen, at least six or seven uh, molecules of oxygen 
would have been produced at least 2.5 billion years ago by uh, the bacteria, initial bacteria. It is called the great oxygenation event. And even after that one, even after 1 billion years, another uh, oxygenation event happened. But that was not organic. That was mainly because of geological uh, processes. And then proliferation happens. So as I said, uh, even life began 4 billion years ago. For the first 3.5 billion years, nothing much happened. Life was just like very small. Uh, it didn't change much. And something uh, uh, incredible happened something around 600 million years ago in a, process, in a time period called Edia current period. So during the Edia current, we start to see different sort of animals. So basically, if you just go uh, to a rock, which was formed 1 billion years ago, you won't find anything interesting. But if you go to an area, uh, the rocks that were formed 600 million years ago, you would see animals that looks like this. Uh, this is uh, basically, if you look in the middle, you see a small mat-like uh, creature that is called Dickinsonia. Very recently, they found that as an animal and not a plant. And you also have many sort of animals. Uh, for example, this is called Cooksonia. And there are initial uh, small animals uh, that had a sh hard shell and other ones. So Ediacaran fauna is the first uh, multicellular organisms that evolved on the planet. And then we have a Cambrian fauna. So Cambrian is, uh, it used to be a very uh, puzzling thing for scientists for a very long time. That means like suddenly 550 million years ago, you start to see different sort of animals, animals that you can't even imagine about. For example, uh, in the lowest corner, you can actually see an animal called Opabnia. So Opabnia was actually found, uh, uh, sorry, not Opabnia. Uh, you can also see Anomalocaris, the other one near Opabnia. When people actually found Anomalocaris, they actually found the front two parts of that one. They assumed that is a different animal. So only recently when people started uh, researching more about these animals, they all put together and they understood that this is not different animals, but parts that belong to a single animal. And then you also have a first kind of trilobite. So people really they didn't really understand how this diversity came into being suddenly. So that is called, uh, uh, mostly people uh, assume it, uh, they call it Cambrian explosion. So Cambrian explosion right now we can ex explain by different ways because it is not very slow. So when people say it suddenly in geological timescales, it means in millions of years. So uh, this is the second fauna that evolved. So this is what the Cambrian period would have looked like. So basically, I have three parts here. So one is an animal called hallucinogenia. So hallucinogenia means uh, if you're hallucinating, if you're drunk, or if you take any sort of uh, uh, hallucinogenic, uh, hallucinogenic uh, drugs, if you imagine, if you dream about an animal, that might uh, look like that one. So that's how weird the animals in Cambrian period were. And also to the left, you can also see what the world looked like back then. And also at the top, you can actually see the planet. This is what the planet actually uh, uh, looked like. Uh, uh, because of continental drift, the, planet, uh, the continents were moving uh, every uh, time, every minute. But back then, if you just rewind everything, the, this is what the planet looked like. And, and these are some fossils that are currently with me in my uh, personal collection. So you can actually see a, a fossil called Eldraktia kingi, the black one uh, to the left-hand side. And uh, there are places in U uh, US, uh, in places like states like Utah, where you can actually still go and find millions of fossils of these animals still lying there. So uh, fossilization is a very uh, rare process. That means if you have 1 million animals, only 1,000 animals might end up as a fossil. But imagine if you find an animal, if you find a place where you can actually find millions of fossils in one area, you can do the math and then try to understand how many animals might have lived back then. And uh, to the right hand side, there's a head of a small uh, uh, Eldridge Evans Chusa. This is another fossil that is found in what is now Bolivia. So if you look carefully, uh, there are two small uh, areas where you can actually see the eyes of these fossils. So trilobites are the first animals to see the world very clearly. That means uh, before that one, animals evolved light sensitive cells through which they can actually understand where light is coming from. But uh, trilobites were the first animals to evolve a very complex eyes through which they could see very clearly. So for example, if you just go and pick a butterfly, you can see a complex eye in a butterfly. And before butterflies came into being, trilobites 500 million years ago had the first complex eyes. And uh, this is a uh, time period called Ordovician. So Ordovician existed something around four, four, like four, 480 million years ago. And this is when metazoans, you, so if you, if you are into biology, you would know metazoan animals. So metazoans diversified. And what I always do is like wherever I go in India or in other countries, I try to find uh, rocks that belong to that time period. And after careful uh, uh, inquiry and looking after, for these rocks for several years, I found this uh, uh, rocks dating back to the Ordovician period and what is now Ras al-Khaimah, uh, which is a small emirate in UAE. 
So for example, you can actually see a Nautilus, a Nautiloid. So basically uh, in the first slide, I showed a coiled Nautilus, but Nautiluses back then uh, in older vision period were uncoiled and were like a long cones. To the uh, right hand side in the pink rock, you can actually see two different shells. So these are shells of a Nautilus that existed, that lived in the oceans that covered what is now UAE uh, 450 million years ago. And a Silurian period, and Silurian is like, it's uh, uh, like it occurred something around 440 million years and ended like 420 million years ago. This is when we have land plants. So if you take a time machine uh, and go back in time, like say 450 or 450 or like 80 million years ago, you won't see that many plants on the land. You, you, won't, you will see it's just like few moss and algae like thing, but you won't find big plants and big trees and other ones. And only during a uh, Silurian period, uh, we start to see first plants that move into the land. So this is when we see vascular plants. And then after Silurian, for, for, like, for, like uh, continues a time period called Devonian. So before that one fish, uh, we have a lot of fish in this uh, planet. Uh, there are no animals in the land. And uh, only during Devonian period, these fish evolves a jaw. So before that one fish didn't have a jaw, it just had sucker like uh, apparatus where it can actually stick on to animals and, or, or suck animals uh, or food from the bottom of the ground. But they, they lacked a jaw. So only during Devonian period, we start to have uh, jawed fish uh, and also amphibians, animals that could live uh, in the uh, land and in the water. And this is when we also start to see something called a tetrapod. So a tetrapod, this is a time when uh, sea living creatures moved into land and developed or evolved what is called a uh, hind limbs and front limbs, like a, like a, uh, arms like we have. If you're really interested in tetrapod evolution, that means how the transition happened from sea to land, uh, you should pick up a book by uh, this guy called Neil Shubin. He wrote an excellent book about a fossil that dates back to the Devonian period. He, uh, it's called Tiktaalik, and the book name is called Your Inner Fish. Uh, he explains in that book how, ex uh, how the process of uh, sea to land transition happened through the fossils. And below that one, you can also see uh, a huge fish that lived back then. Uh, there were armored fish back then. So armored fish used to live in that area. And we also find fossils of this one uh, from different parts of the world. And this is a, a, a trilobite that uh, lived during that uh, Devonian period. In the earlier slides, I talked to you about the compound eyes. So if you look carefully, you can actually see it in the left-hand side, you can see the compound eyes in the bottom. Uh, so that's how uh, well preserved these fossils are from certain time periods. And this is from Bolivia. And middle Devonian is when we started to have first uh, trees. So before that one, we didn't have trees. And only during Devonian period, we start to have big trees in this area. And Carboniferous is when we start to have big forests. So before that one, no forests, very few scattered plants and trees. And Carboniferous is a reason why we have so much of petrol in Middle East. So at least these plants, uh, these trees, when they die, uh, they uh, uh, get deposited in the bottom of the ground and they get quickly covered. But the problem is these uh, uh, trees had a, a, a protein called lignin, which is very tough to break down. And the, uh, during the Carboniferous, there is not enough bacteria that evolved a capacity to break down this lignin. And because of this one, uh, uh, this uh, plants, they ended up in the bottom of the ground and they uh, carbonized and they turned into carbon. And this carbon is what we find today as fossil fuels or petrol in the Middle East. So Middle East, which is right now a desert, uh, 350 million years ago, it was totally different. It was a very dense forest. And this forest ended up as fossils. And eventually, it ended up as what is now called uh, uh, petrol. And this is Permian. A Permian period is when we start to have uh, the dinosaurs and the reptiles began to diversify. And just when the Permian period ended 250 million years ago, there was a huge extinction event that happened because of uh, a place called Siberia. What is now Siberia in the Northern Hemisphere? There was a huge volcanic eruption that resulted in global cooling. And there was a huge uh, uh, extinction event happened uh, during the Permian period ending. So this is called the mother of all extinction. And this is called the PT extinction or the mother of all extinctions when 99% of, of all living creatures went extinct uh, during time. So when I say 99, it's like slightly lesser than 99. And Triassic uh, followed uh, that Permian. And Triassic is when we start to have the first dinosaurs and first mammals. So uh, mammals back then were very small. And the dinosaurs, even when, when we talk about dinosaurs, we thought, think about dinosaurs being really big animals. But dinosaurs back then were very small. And over the course of time, they evolved uh, a gigantism and they became bigger and bigger. 
and Jurassic is when we start to have the first birds. So for example, uh, in the right hand side, you can actually see Archaeopteryx, one of the first dinosaur like bird. It's not technically a bird, it's still a dinosaur, but it is something which is more closer to what is now the modern birds than it is closer to uh, the dinosaurs. And the other one, other area to the left hand side, you can actually see a Diplodocus longus, which is a, a, a fossil that was found in the US. And uh, right now it is uh, erected and in display um, in Dubai Mall, which is a shopping mall in Dubai. And also Jurassic, we also see a plenty of fish, uh, freshwater fish. This is a fish in the collection. After the lecture, I'll be happy to show you this fish. And uh, we are talking about dinosaur and Cretaceous is a period that existed something around 145 million years ago to 66 million years. And this is when we start to have the first flowering plants. So I, I, again, as I say, if you take a trip to the past, if you want to give somebody a bouquet, if you want to give somebody some flowers, you would find flowers uh, only in the Cretaceous period. Or if you just go back in time, like say uh, 180 million years ago, you would see trees, but no, not even a single flower. So Cretaceous is the time when we start to see the first flowers. And by the end of Cretaceous period, 66 million years ago, a huge asteroid struck Earth and killed all the dinosaurs. And after the dinosaurs went extinct, we start to have mammals. So uh, what I'm going to show you uh, is uh, Cretaceous period also uh, is defined by a splendid fossils called uh, ammonites. I'll be showing some ammonites by the end of the lecture. And uh, this is what an ammonite looks like uh, when it, is it was alive. And this is a nautilus. And I'll be uh, talking to you about uh, when I'm when when you watch Discovery Channel, National Geographic, and other ones, you would see paleontologists going and finding dinosaur bones in what is now um, North America, U.S., uh, Mongolia, and other ones. We always overlook what is in our own backyard. So, for example, if you go to a place called Arilur and Parambolur, so these are districts which is very next to Trichy and other areas. These areas consist rocks that were formed under the ocean something around 120 million years ago till 60 million years ago. So you can actually find fossils of these animals in this area in our own backyard. So I'm going to show you some fossils, uh, photos of the fossils that I found uh, in Arilo. So this is a place where I go every year. I kind of uh, love to explore this area, find fossils, research them, and compare the same sort of fossils in different parts of the world. So for example, there's a place called Therani. So Therani is in a place, uh, it's in Perambulu district where you can actually find uh, plenty of uh, mines. There are a lot of clay mines there uh, where you can, in the clay layers, you can actually find uh, impressions of uh, fossil plants. So this is what a mine looks like. As I said, the principle is superposition. Uh, the topmost layer is the youngest layer and the deeper you go, the rocks become older and older. So if you want to find older fossils, you have to go down deeper. And then there's a place called Satanur, uh, which is also in Peramalu district, where you can actually find a really big uh, tree. So by looking at the tree, you can actually understand how big the tree uh, used to be. So this is a fossilized tree, which is roughly like say 90 million years ago old. And uh, this is a tree that lived on the ground. And when it died, it was washed into the ocean. And then it got deposited and became a fossil in the ocean floor. And that's the reason why if you look carefully at these plants, if this tree fossil, you can actually find small encrusted mollusk or seashells and other ones in these uh, areas. So this is how the one of the biggest fossils that you can actually find in uh, Tamil Nadu. And also uh, a Kare formation, which is follows that tree, which is like much more younger. But this is a time period uh, uh, where this area was covered by a very deep <coughs> uh, sea. So all the bullet like sharp things that you see are uh, ancient uh, cephalopods. So basically, these are related to modern day squids. So we call it belemnites. So belemnites are like long uh, snouted uh, or, or like squids that had a very uh, tough shell, which is called a rostrum. So basically when these animals die, uh, they settle down to the bottom and the rostrum end up, ends up as a fossil that we can still go and find there. And you can also, this is what a belemnite fossil looks like in situ. And this is what a belemnite looks when it was alive. And uh, this is what this is what Arilur might have looked like, uh, like say 80 million years ago to 66 million years ago. So there are evidences for sharks living in that area. There are evidences for uh, ammonites, plenty of ammonites, thousands of them. You can also see evidences for uh, turtles and other sort of animals here. But having said that, there are possibilities of other animals to have existed in that area, which we still haven't found evidences of. We still have to. Uh, explore the area much and see what these animals, uh, what sort of animals live there. So we've been collecting fossils only for the past 100 years, which is not enough to understand that area, or which is not enough to understand what happened in 80 million years history. 
And this is uh, an impression of a, um, a sort of 80 million year old ammonites. Uh, basically, you can find ammonites in different shapes and sizes there. You can see how big that, this is just a fragment of that one. So also in rocks, you can actually find seashells. And this is also uh, an ammonite fossil that's found there. So as I said, ammonites can come in different sizes and shapes. So the smallest ammonite that you can actually see, it's a size of a pen tip. So sometimes you can actually find bigger ones, the size of my palm. Sometimes you, this is an ammonite that was found in Madagascar. And uh, also some ammonites are uh, this big. So uh, this is called a cartwheel ammonite. So placentiseras, I believe. These ammonites are found in um, uh, Trichy again, Arilur. And right now it is in a display in National College uh, before the Department of Geology there. And some ammonites can be even bigger than me. So uh, this is a chart that shows how uh, uh, ammonites uh, were so abundant during the permanent, during the Triassic period and their numbers go down during Jurassic. And they again, the diversity goes up during the Cretaceous and after that they went totally extinct. So we don't have ammonites anymore. All the ammonites are extinct. We don't have any ammonites living right now. So this is what uh, the seafloor would have looked like back then. So basically you can actually see all sorts of animals there. So you can see uh, belemnites swimming around. You can see an ammonite there. So this is a reverse, ammonite should be going the other way. And also the long tube-like structures that you see are called rudus. So these are kind of a seashell that existed back then in the Cretaceous period. As you know, seashells are like two valves. I'll show you this rudus also, but back then they used to be uh, very different uh, uh, sort of seashells. And also this is an echinoid, a kind of a sand dollar. And uh, after Cretaceous period, there is also an area where the sea moved in once again uh, uh, after the Cretaceous period, after the dinosaurs went extinct. And still you can see uh, remains of seashells, mostly gastropods uh, found there fossilized. And, um, and also, as I say, uh, Arilur, you can find dinosaur bones and dinosaur eggs. So what I'm holding is an egg of a, a velociraptor that lived like say uh, 70 million years ago in what is now Mongolia. And uh, we don't have evidences for velociraptors living in Arilur, but we have evidences for the long-necked uh, titanosaurus uh, and the other few uh, theropod dinosaurs that lived in what is now Arilur. So this is a small bone. Sometimes you will also find uh, dinosaur bones dating back to the Cretaceous period. Sometimes you'll also see Pleistocene uh, bones, like bones that are like a few uh, hundred thousand years old. And this is uh, uh, evidence for and a different sort of animals, like there were crocodiles living in that area. Uh, for example, these are evidences for uh, fossils of uh, fossil teeth of crocodiles that lived in what is now Arilo. And this is what Arilo might have looked like uh, 70 million years ago. And we also have evidences for uh, dinosaurs like Trudon uh, living in that one. So Trudon is known only from no North America. Uh, and we really didn't imagine that these animals might have also lived in what is now Arilo. Uh, now we have evidences that this sort of dinosaurs lived in Arilo also. And calamity, I'm, I'm talking about extinction. So basically extinction is constant uh, every now and then. For example, we have this coronavirus pandemic uh, that kind of killed so many people. And if you're really worried about uh, COVID being one of the most catastrophic events in human history or in the history of the planet, uh, you, are to you should be, I mean, like you're you are totally wrong because there were five major extinctions that happened and wiped out the life uh, nearly uh, most of the uh, time. For example, the first uh, event happened something around uh, end of Ordovician period. And this extinction happened something around for uh, 10 million years. And that kind of uh, killed off 80% of the life on Earth. And, uh, uh, and then after that, Devonian, another sort of extinction that happened uh, that lasted for less than 3 million years. And that killed off 80% of animals again. And the unpermian uh, Triassic extinction that I was talking about, which is the most uh, catastrophic and the most destructive extinction in the history of the planet, uh, happened in Unpermian, which is a Permian Triassic extinction that killed off 95 percentage of uh, the world uh, population or the diversity. And then at the end of Triassic, another extinction that happened for three million years killed uh, 80 percentage of animals. And also the last and the most recent uh, catastrophic extinction that, that happened is like 66 million years ago, the end of Cretaceous that killed most of the dinosaurs and most of the uh, marine creatures like ammonites. So this is a chart that, like for example, when you when you see uh, the arrow marks, there is always a dip in that genera, uh, the diversity of that one. So whenever you see a dip, that means there's a huge extinction that happened. For example, you find certain animals before that time period and after that time period, you won't find
find that specific fossil. That means that animal has gone extinct. For example, in the Cretaceous period, before 66 million years, you would find uh, rocks, uh, uh, in, in these rocks, you would find dinosaur bones. But any rocks that formed after 66 million years, after the Cretaceous period, like in the Paleogene rocks, you won't find a single dinosaur bone that shows that the dinosaurs actually went extinct. And that's how uh, paleontologists can actually tell us when an animal lived and when an animal uh, went extinct. So uh, this is how fossils are found in Arielur. Basically, uh, the fossils are found in, in millions and millions. So basically, there are areas which is right now currently owned by Tamil Nadu cements. So basically, you can go there and not pick up anything which is not a fossil. Uh, everything that you go there will be a fossil. Certain fossils are found also in other parts of the world. For example, these are called uh, these seashells are called pycnodons. So pycnodons are also found in other parts of the world, especially in North America. Certain pycnodons uh, 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 I've sent personally sent some samples to Mississippi Museum of Natural History, and I've also received some pycnodons from Mississippi so that I can compare uh, how animals uh, lived uh, in two different areas in the same time period. And uh, also, again, a small strata where you can actually see thousands of fossils. Everything white and circular is a fossil there. And uh, well, cognizance, I've come back to the last one. So one big question is like why we study um, uh, uh, all these animals, why they went extinct, and what's the point of reading about all this one? It can uh, basically, there's a thing about history is that if you learn history, if you, if you really try to understand what happened in the past, uh, you don't have to repeat the same mistakes again. I mean, like uh, in this case, nature has did some several experiments for us uh, to show what really happens if some factors go wrong. And if you if you really understand what really happened in the past, what really went wrong, and how it changed life on Earth, we can adapt or we can change the ways that we uh, operate. For example, climate change. Uh, we have evidences for climate change to kill kill many animals, and many animals went extinct. And in order to understand anthropogenic climate change, which is happening right now, if you if you try to understand how it is happening uh, with the evidences that we have already, we can predict how the world will react, how the biodiversity will change, so that we can actually take necessary actions. And that's one reason why we should understand uh, uh, why uh, fossils are available. That's where, how fossils come into uh, the scene. So here I have two different uh, phylogenetic trees. So basically, uh, the one uh, left is uh, by Ernst Haeckel, uh, which is like uh, at least like 200 years uh, old uh, ones that uh, places different animals in different areas. To the right hand side, you can actually see uh, a, a phylogenetic tree constructed using uh, RNA uh, data uh, by this guy called David Hillis and his team. So basically, there are 3,000 animals uh, compared and placed in different areas. So you can actually see a single origin here and how these animals uh, uh, diversified and evolved. So it is very, you can download this from the internet. If you want, you can actually send me a message. I can send you the link to that one. And you can print it out in an A0 paper and use a magnifying glass to see uh, where humans are. So uh, finally, before I close, so uh, I, I, we run a channel called Scientific Tumblins. So if you're really interested in following us, uh, uh, we release videos every now and then. You can uh, go to this channel and you can check it out. We have videos on astronomy. And I personally do uh, videos on evolution, fossils, and also you can, you can follow my field trips there. So uh, thank you so much. I'll show you some fossils right now. Sir, thank you so much, sir. Yeah. So if you want, I'll show some fossils to the people there. OK, ma'am. OK, sir. OK, sir. Uh, so here is what I have. So when I'm talking about uh, the great oxygenation event, I was talking about something like red uh, thing. So this is a rock which is like 4 billion years old or 3.5 billion years old. Uh, this is uh, from uh, Australia, and this formed when this little bacteria released oxygen, and the oxygen reacted with iron that was uh, released from the ground and settled down at the bottom of the ocean. So this is called a bandadine formation. It is one of the oldest trace fossils that we can actually find. <coughs> oh, there are other fossils also. So basically, I was talking about fish. Uh, so if you see this fish, this is from China. So this is a fossil called Lycoptera. So it, sometimes fossils can be very explicit. You can actually see fossils where you can actually see the eyes very clearly. So you can see the eyes here. And you can also see the vertebra and all the fins that are uh, very uh, present very clearly. So as I said, 
there are different layers. So this fossil is found in a layer, which is a one, 125 million years old uh, layer. And uh, also, this is, uh, this is what is called a trilobite. Oh, okay. uh, sorry, this is a trilobite. So you can see the head, you can see the thorax and the abdomen. And here you can actually see the compound eyes in the corner. So this actually gives us, this is something around 430 million years old, uh, a trilobite that lived uh, during the Cambrian period. And uh, also when I'm talking about uh, nautiluses, so this is a nautilus, uh, 80, 83 million years old nautilus. So basically you can see uh, the tube through which the siphon goes through so that, so that it can actually suck in the air and maintain the buoyancy so that it can, so when it has full of air, it can uh, float up. Uh, when it fills it with less of air, it can sink down to the bottom of the ocean. So this is an ammonite and some ammonites can be of this size also. So basically not all the fossils are very clean like this. Uh, sometimes you'll also find fossils like this, which you have to clean uh, later on in, in time. But some ammonites can be absolutely very clean. So for example, you see an ammonite here and another sort of uh, ammonite uh, in this area. So 66 million years ago, ammonites went extinct, but this animal uh, uh, lived, uh, this animal went extinct. Uh, uh, this is ammonite, this is what an ammonite looks like. So this is like what lived like say 80 million years ago, the same time when the ammonites, uh, when the nautiluses were living. So this is what an ammonite fossil uh, looks like. So what happens is like you have a coiled shell and there are multiple chambers in the middle separated by walls called septa. So there are many septa and in the corner, you will have this animal. There are eight tentacles coming from this one and by sucking and this one by uh, the uh, method called, <coughs> I'm so sorry, uh, by that method, it can actually swim in the uh, bottom of the ocean. So ammonites, as I said, ammonites can come in different shapes and sizes. And uh, some ammonites can be like this and like this. So uh, these are some ammonites that uh, uh, lived in the bottom of the ocean. And also, uh, as I've said, uh, there's a process called the presence. Present is the key to the past. By looking at animals that live right now, we can understand what animals might have looked uh, or lived back then. So for example, uh, this is a seashell that you might all know. Uh, this is a seashell that lived uh, approximately 20,000 years ago uh, in the bottom of the ocean. And uh, uh, basically you, you will see similar seashells even today. But this is a seashell that lived uh, by about 85 million years ago. So this is a fossil seashell that lived back then. So as I said, seashells can come in different sizes and shapes. So this is a, a seashell. So this is this seashell is related to this seashell, but this is a seashell called a rudest. So rudest are bivalves that existed uh, during the Cretaceous period, that lived during the Cretaceous period. But basically, you can see one shell. This is the, uh, the seashells have two valves, right and left valve. So this valve can be compared to this valve. And instead of an identical valve, it had a long tube. It had a modified, highly evolved, uh, elongated tube, and half of it can be buried under the ground. So if there is a huge tidal wave or something, it can't be uh, washed into the bottom of the ocean. So this is one more uh, rhodus called Dictyoplicus morgani that lived uh, in the oceans that covered, there's an ocean called Tethys that covered, uh, during the Cretaceous period, covered most of uh, <coughs> the world and this is from the UAE, the United Arab Emirates. So what is now a desert used to be uh, a sea back then. So <clears throat> again, uh, some more fossils that I have. Some fossils can be very uh, beautiful. Uh, here you can actually see uh, 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 an ammonite. You can still see the color even after 190 million years, you can still see the color. And this is, a, this is from a place called Dorset, which is in England. So you can actually find uh, fossils in these rocks there in that period also. But when I say uh, fossils, so fossils are nothing, uh, not just uh, these kind of animals also. So this is a kind of a seashell. This is just uh, a seashell like this. So basically this seashell in the edges, you can actually see some sort of a serration here. But 66 million years ago, you had a seashell that looked like this. So people even today, if you go to Arilur, they mistake it for 
a, a, a tooth of a jaw of an animal or a dinosaur, but it's not technically a jaw, but it's actually a seashell. So it looks like a flower, but it actually has two shells. Uh, th this is one well, and there is a, another well that opens and closes, that opens and closes just like that. And uh, this one is a six to six million year old echinoid. <clears throat> so it is related to modern day uh, sand dollars. So basically you can see this is, this is called a, a test, an outer shell, a hard exoskeleton. And uh, here you can see the anus, and here you can actually see the mouth of that animal here. And uh, uh, this is also called, this is a, a called a rectus. This is called a terbratula. So this is, uh, this might look superficially like a bivalve, but it's not a bivalve. It's, it's a bivalve again, but it's not related to these ones. These are called brachiopods. So these brachiopods uh, basically had a small, if you can see a small hole in this one. So there used to be a stalk. There used to be a small uh, stalk coming up and they used to move here and there and it used to open filter food and close it once again. So these sort of brachiopods lived in the ocean uh, 66 million years ago. And again, uh, seashells, you'll see plenty. So you can you, you know what the seashell looks like. So this is a modern day seashell, uh, but this one uh, lived in the ocean, uh, like say 80 million years ago. So this is like say 10 years old, but uh, what separates this from this one is 80 million years. And uh, you might also know what these gastropods look like. So these are gastropods that are found in the bottom of the ocean. But right now it is found in a mountain in the middle of the desert. Also I have one more uh, ammonite, which is very clear. So you can actually see the joints. So every septa will be uh, differentiated by what is called a susha point. So these susha point actually is very complicated. And uh, they, uh, if, you're, if you're learning fractals, uh, uh, these are or Fibonacci numbers and other ones. You can try to uh, understand and make it uh, uh, make much more sense by looking at these suture patterns. <coughs> and finally, uh, again, I have one more uh, seashell. So this is a gastropod. So as I said, uh, uh, this is uh, in, in Tamil, we call it Sangu. So this is a kind of a gastropod that find uh, found in this area. Uh, this is also a gastropod. This is called, this is a gastropod called Actionellid. So uh, in the place where I work, uh, you can find thousands, um, uh, no, uh, millions of them in the same uh, area. And uh, also plants, trees can end up as fossils. So this is a, a, a fossil of a tree that lived in the Cretaceous uh, ground and over the course of time it died and settled down in a riverbed that we can still go to uh, places like Arilur and Perambolo. We can find this one still there. <coughs> and also one final uh, thing I have is um, uh, a fossil of a dinosaur called Ceratosaurus. So basically, uh, this lived 140 million years ago. And uh, this is a <coughs> uh, upper maxilla. So this is the upper jaw. And uh, basically, if, uh, uh, one more uh, trivia is that dinosaurs used to uh, lose teeth every now and then. We know that because if you look carefully, uh, this is a long uh, teeth uh, that the dinosaur had, but there is one missing here. But that, that means another small baby teeth is still coming uh, uh, over there. So dinosaurs had teeth like a uh, conveyor belt. Every now and then dinosaurs used to lose teeth and they would get another new set of teeth um, within a week. So plant eating dinosaurs uh, uh, had new uh, set of replacement teeth very quickly compared to um, uh, carnivorous dinosaurs. Carnivorous dinosaurs got it very slow. So these are some fossils that I uh, have in my personal collection. And most of the fossils are there uh, in India. <clears throat> there are many rules and regulations uh, that you need to follow uh, in order to uh, take fossils from one country to another one. So that's one reason why I can't, uh, I couldn't bring all the fossils with me. So before I uh, finish this lecture, there is one more <coughs> trivia that I want to give you to you. Uh, that means we are talking about birds right now. And when people say uh, birds, dinosaurs went extinct, uh, they are wrong. Dinosaurs didn't really go extinct, but dinosaurs are still among us. Uh, when uh, people say dinosaurs went extinct, it's totally wrong to say just like that. We have to say very clearly, we have to say very concretely what went extinct. Uh, it is always the non-avian dinosaurs that went extinct and not uh, the avian dinosaurs. So for example, the dinosaurs like T-Rex and uh, Titanosaurus, sauropods, uh, the Brachiosaurus and all, all the other animals, they went extinct because they couldn't fly. Uh, the flying animals, Call, which we call right now as birds, are technically dinosaurs. 
for example, I have a small uh, uh, dinosaur uh, model. So basically, uh, a dinosaur has to have three major features. For example, it has to have something called the anterior and posterior fenestra. So uh, dinosaur, uh, the eyes are here, but it also has small holes in the back of the head and also in the forward, in, in the snouts. So an animal, if you want to consider it a dinosaur, it has to have these two. Second one, you can find the legs that are coming directly beneath the body. So basically, the legs are coming from the uh, body and not from the sides. <clears throat> For example, if you see uh, crocodiles <clears throat> or if you see uh, lizards, the lizards have <clears throat> uh, 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 legs coming from the sides and not from the direct uh, uh, beneath the body. And one more thing is like, if you want to consider some animal as a dinosaur, it also should have feathers. And most of the dinosaurs had some sort of a feathers. So, so only those animals have uh, having all these characteristics can be considered as a dinosaur. So a T-Rex had all that one. Uh, also, uh, the animal that we have right now is a common chicken. So if you are a fan of a chicken uh, meal, you have literally eaten a dinosaur and not a uh, bird because birds are because also one more thing is birds lay eggs uh, dinosaurs laid eggs uh, birds are warm blooded dinosaurs were warm blooded so all these characteristics go uh, with each other and that's how we can uh, say the dinosaurs uh, they didn't really go extinct uh, but birds survived and birds are not uh, related to dinosaurs or birds didn't evolve from dinosaurs but birds are technically dinosaurs uh, in this one so <clears throat> I uh, hope you all enjoyed the uh, lecture. Uh, so uh, please do let me know if you have any uh, questions or if you want to see any fossils once again, I can uh, do that. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Will. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Sir, you have given a new platform for us. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. I would really appreciate... Uh, oh, uh, Dr. Rajesh, thank you so much. I missed your early comment. Uh, that I uh, also, uh, I'm an alumni of uh, Madurai American College, uh, where Mr. Rajesh is actually currently uh, teaching. Uh, and uh, to be to say something about uh, uh, American College, although I uh, 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 got interested in fossils for a very long time, the first fossil that I saw uh, in my life is in 2006, when I joined uh, uh, doing my undergraduate zoology there. And American College Zoology Department has an amazing uh, museum where they have uh, several hundreds of fossils there. And that is where I found uh, the first fossil. And they also have a, a beautiful cast of uh, the legendary Archaeopteryx, the Berlin specimen. Uh, they have it there. And that's how uh, I started collecting fossils. And uh, I, I, it's very tough to isolate bacteria because um, uh, these fossils, uh, any, I mean, like, I, I didn't personally try to uh, isolate bacteria there. Uh, even if there is a bacteria, it, it must be a uh, modern bacteria that lives uh, right now because after uh, the fossil undergoes a lot of changes, there might be plenty of uh, uh, bacteria and other uh, microorganisms living in that one. So uh, it's very tough to say that even if I isolate bacteria, that was a bacteria that uh, lived uh, millions of years ago. <coughs> oh, dodo bird. Uh, dodo bird actually is, uh, it, it went extinct not because of any natural uh, 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 a process. Uh, dodos and certain animals were uh, killed by human uh, factors because <coughs> my uh, sorry, dodos were adapted to an area where uh, these animals lived when there is no uh, natural predators and there were no natural uh, uh, predators like uh, any big animals or humans. So when humans actually went there, dodos uh, were totally uh, immune. I mean, the dodos were kind of like, uh, they didn't evolve any sort of response towards a bigger animal. So it was very uh, easy for humans to go and hunt dodos, and uh, dodos were hunted to extinction. Uh, just like uh, 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 it, after the Pleistocene, uh, several animals like saber-toothed cats, mammoths were hunted to extinction because of human things. Uh, shall we <coughs> uh, shall we say dinosaurs are connecting link between birds and reptile? Uh, yes, uh, even the, the the question is it's really really tough to. Um, uh, uh, recently read a, a review paper. That talks uh, that literally argues that we should not call birds as birds uh, or apes. It is uh, totally right to classify birds into reptiles. Uh, so birds are uh, technically reptiles, and they also classify into a group called Archosaurus. So Archosaurus is where we also have birds, dinosaurs, and also the lizards and uh, all uh, living uh, uh, crocodiles and other ones. So 
Uh, dinosaurs are technically, uh, birds are technically dinosaurs, and dinosaurs being reptiles, they are reptiles. So, <clears throat> can you suggest some journals? On <clears throat> oh, there are plenty of journals uh, in vertebrate paleontology, but if you want, if you're really looking into any special uh, papers or any, there are many seminal works that have been done, uh, uh, there are uh, works done every now and then. So if you really want some specific papers, uh, I can uh, personally guide you uh, to that one. But there are plenty. There are plenty of journals by uh, vertebrate paleontology. And if you're really interested, uh, you should follow the Society of Vertebrate Paleontology, uh, SVP. <coughs> so uh, any other questions? Uh, this thing features an old and new world primates. Oh, that's a that to, uh, to be honest, that is a totally uh, uh, a, a question that deserves a whole uh, two hours of lectures. <clears throat> uh, that is a very uh, uh, long question, but I would be more than just happy to write a reply uh, to the person who asked this question. And Mr. Ramji, if you can uh, just get the contact details of the person, I can uh, send them the details. Also, the courses uh, that uh, there are many free courses that you can actually take. Uh, okay. to in for that one and also a friend of mine is actually uh, uh, like conducting a course on phylogenetic uh, reconstruction uh, if you have no uh, prior uh, incident or, or experience in uh, uh, bioinformatics you can still take that uh, course <clears throat> and uh, these are done by one of the most efficient uh, eminent uh, paleont i mean uh, evolutionary biologists in the india so <clears throat> i can get you the details Thank you. The last question. Yeah. Uh, human beings for monkey or not? Uh, well, uh, uh, as I said before, it is totally a wrong uh, thing to assume that we came from monkeys. Uh, if you are if, if you are assuming a human evolutionary chart, like for example, you have uh, ape-like ancestors. This animal evolves into a different animal, slow one by one, and Monkeys are a different branch. So, for example, uh, humans evolved from monkey-like ancestors or ancestors that look like apes, that they didn't have tails. But over the course of time, that sort of splits. <clears throat> for example, in, uh, in the primate evolution, nine million years ago, uh, there was a huge split that happened. And <clears throat> that sort of divided uh, humans from uh, gorillas and other ones. And six million years ago, that split happened where chimpanzees and other monkeys uh, moved away from humans. <clears throat> so if you ask me, it, if anyone says humans are from monkeys, they are wrong. But humans are not from monkeys. Monkeys are our cousins. <clears throat> monkeys evolved just like us. But monkeys came from an ape-like ancestor that they didn't have a tail. <clears throat> Thank, you, sir. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much. So thank you for the opportunity and thank you for the wonderful questions. And uh, if you can uh, send me the details of the person who asked for the question about the courses, I'd be more than just happy to send you the send him the links and uh, details. Sure, sir. Sure, uh, I, sir. I will identify, I identify him and I will send you a number to him. Sir. Definitely, definitely. Okay, sir. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, sir, for giving such informative information for us. Thank you so much, sir. Thank, thank you so you, much. You. I'll see you again. Thank you, participants. Thank you for your cooperation. It is a time to end the session. And also, it's my humble request, dear participants, I have sent the mail for today's webinar link. And also, I have sent the feedback link to all the mail who have registered mail ID only. Then another I need one favor from uh, participant side. Kindly, please enter the correct email ID. Moreover, today's participation, registered participation is above 600, but the wrong mail ID is above 200. I am getting for uh, each and every webinar, I am getting more than uh, 200 uh, email ID is entirely wrong. They are simply typing Gmail as gmli for dot com, they are uh, typing as a con. -con. So kindly please cooperate with us. We are struggling more. Without your uh, presence, we are nothing. Thank you. Please cooperate with us. Thank you very much.
for your participation soon we will meet in our next webinar thank you thank you one and all